。有幸的邀请为第一位报告人，是著名的物理学家、英国皇家学会会院士、新加坡国立大学先进暗微材料中心教授康斯坦丁·诺乌肖诺夫教授。他因为石墨烯的开创者的研究获得了二零一零年的诺贝尔奖物理奖，也是一九七三年以来最年轻的物理学奖获得者，并于二零一二年获得了爵士学位、爵士称号。他的研究包括凝聚态等一系列，做出了开创的成果。本次的研究报告是《Material of the Future》，让我们热烈的掌声欢迎康斯坦丁教授。Um, good morning, everyone. It's really a fantastic pleasure to be back to, to Beijing. It's, a, it's my most sincere congratulations to uh, Liu Zhofan. It's really, it's clearly extremely uh, impressive uh, graphene research center which he created. It's probably the most advanced uh, research center in the world in terms of technology. And it's really, it's, uh, uh, and it's really clear that it's not only advanced now, but it also has a huge potential for the future. It's quite an, an interesting material. It looks like the more we, we research into it, the more opportunities it, it gives to us. So I'm, I'm sure that in, in a few years' time, there will be much more uh, new applications discovered here. Anyway, for, um, for my today talk, I would really like to start a little bit on graphene, but, but uh, more to look in, into the future and discuss not only the materials per se, but uh, really more into the uh, technologies and methods which we can use to, to, to work on the, on, the, on the new materials. Still, um, the most convenient place to start is Surprise, surprise, graphene, after all, is the, is the graphene research forum. And it's, it's, of course, it gives us quite a few opportunities because of its unique, um, unique properties. It's the most, uh, the strongest, most conductive, thermally conductive, uh, flexible, impermeable, and so on, and so on, and so on. And because of that, it, it, it really gave us uh, quite a number of, of different opportunities in many different sectors from energy to composites, from electronics to, to, to sensors. But of course, it, it's, a, it's a very special material for us, for, for those people who, who've been working with it for a number of years, yet when, when it comes to applications, it's actually not that special because it, it, it clearly follows the footsteps of many other materials before it start being applied, same as carbon nanotubes, same as fullerene, same as, as, um, as carbon fibers. Uh, it starts to be applied in the composite materials. So uh, uh, Benny is here. He worked on the on this uh, world most expensive and most light and the uh, lightest uh, watch uh, is the collaboration between Richard Miller, McLaren, and Manchester University. But then it started to go more more into real applications, not only gimmicks. So it started to be applied in the uh, in the um, in the automotive industry. Of course, these days we all know uh, one of the major application of this material is for thermal management. Most of the Huawei phones would have graphene inside. And if we need to look into the future, I would say that uh, optoelectronics is probably the most um, uh, exciting application. And that's really all up to the uh, BGI center because we really need to learn how to transfer high quality graphene and merge it with uh, Siemens technology. And that's exactly what they, what they do, what they do here. So all the hopes, all the, all the pressure on you guys. Um, so of course, the, uh, what's, what is the, the major, the, the biggest strengths here is that uh, BGI really pushed it from the flake preparation. So a long time ago, we started with the uh, scotch tape technique by exfoliating graphite, which is the material you, you find in your pencils, into the, uh, into the proper, uh, proper mass production uh, CVD with the 
technique being 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 developed here, and when you run carbon containing gas on, on, on top of uh, hot catalyst and then it, it cracks on the surface carbon it rearranges itself into 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 graphene and then hydrogen hydrogen flies away so uh, the the beauty of this method that you can pre you can use pretty much any feedstock for the as your as your carbon source some time ago we are, well we're still writing this paper even up to now. Um, we, we just use this. It's the, you just you, you can you can use pretty much anything which has carbon inside. So basically, you just prick your finger. So if there is nothing around, you just prick your finger, put it put it on the on the on copper and stick it inside the inside the furnace, and voila, you got you got your your graphene. But of course, the um, probably uh, well, it's. A bit of a joke, but uh, in reality, I'm sure that you have seen pictures like this with the flares uh, quite often across, uh, across many petrochemical plants and so on. And there you, you would have it's uh, we basically burn the supporting gas and the waste gas because methane is much worse uh, greenhouse gas than 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 CO2. Much better to emit CO2 rather than methane. And so there we have everything. We have the the heat which we need to produce graphene. We have the carbon containing gas. So uh, basically, we created those machines which can which don't which don't need electricity. It can convert those that supporting gas and heat into the into graphene directly. More where it can register it on the on the ledger, so because there is there is a, a proof of work simultaneously. Okay. Anyway, so um, now we just uh, but there are many other ways how to produce. Uh, how to produce graphene as well. So there are uh, there is the uh, uh, the liquid phase exfoliation. There are many epitaxial techniques. But the the, the big breakthrough was uh, was made in this in this area when people realized that graphene is not the only material which is available to us in the two dimensional form. We can actually exfoliate many other two dimensional crystals. And these days we are talking about a full a full uh, family of those. 2D of those 2D materials. Moreover, if you, if those if this huge family, which is probably a couple of hundred members, probably more in terms of those which are predicted, not yet synthesized, probably a, a good one and a half thousand, again probably more. But if, if, if that is not enough, you can actually start. You can produce uh, artificial materials just by stacking uh, those those two, two d crystals together in the so-called one the vows heterostructures and then you can create materials on demand and this is basically the state of that technology as we have it now we don't need to be slaves of the existing materials we can create those new artificial artificial crystals and we can uh, and, and and we can tune their properties for for uh, specific applications. So just uh, so one example is this: those LEDs. So graphene plays only secondary role. So you basically inject, uh, you, you you use graphene as transparent uh, electrodes. You inject electron holes into those quantum wells, uh, which are made from the from the 2D semiconductors, and it can emit uh, emit light. And because there are so many of those materials available to us, we, we, we can actually we, we can really fine tune the properties of those of those heterostructures in a, in a huge range. So so th this is basically a very long introduction, just to say that these days we can produce materials on demand with the properties which can be tuned in quite in quite a large variety. Now the, the question is what uh, what can we expect in the future? So if you would uh, if you would be able to unleash your imagination, what kind of materials would you what would you like to to create? And um, well really I really like this um, this way how to um, uh, the the best way how to introduce it. I think it's uh, really look look into the uh, into the futuristic movies which people created. So there they really 
talk about about the future materials as they as they thought it would be. So I'm sure many of you would recognize it's the Terminator 2 movie. Uh, so the the plot is that Rob. So the movie was made in '91, and the plot is that Robert from uh, 2029 sent back into 1991 to kill Sarah Connor and her son. And the only reason I'm showing it to you is just to show you how people thought the future materials would be like made from uh, liquid metal, changing shape, self-healing, changing color, and so on and so on and so on. So now we are in 2023 and the, uh, I've got a bad news for you that unless we change something uh, about our technology, we absolutely have no chance to fulfill the dreams of those uh, of the director of the Terminator 2 movie. So our and it's not really a problem of the of of the um, uh, of the materials or, or of the robotics. It's really it's a problem of our approach to technology. We 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 adopt the so-called top-down uh, functionality in our. Uh, technologies when individual components are not are not functional at all so the functionality only comes on the level of the on, on the level of the system you basically need to assemble every single last piece every every single last cogwheel and then you would you would get certain functionality and this is true about the uh, the clockwork is true about robotics or electronics or any other technologies you name it so, um, so the but if you think about the uh, nature and uh, biological systems, they actually work on a completely different pretend because there the functionality is spread across all the all the possible levels, and that's so the individual proteins are functional, the uh, the uh, cells of the uh, so the um, membranes, the cells, the organs. So the, their functionality is is really spread across across. All the uh, all the scales. So the question is, can we try to adopt the same approach into uh, in in our modern technologies and delegate some of the functionalities down to the material level? And that's what we call the functional intelligent materials. So it's the materials which we uh, which we try to program to do specific functions and also intelligence. Well, the 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 simplest possible way of of uh, introduce intelligence is to introduce memory. So uh, just let me give you um, an example of, of uh, what I mean. Um, graphene membranes are being used for, for desalination. So in some areas, like in Singapore or in, in Israel, 100% of water comes through the uh, through membranes. So not, not graphene membranes, but there are also Factories say in, in 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 Australia, which produce graphene membranes as well. So and it works fine. It works. It works. It works well. But it doesn't matter which one, which membrane do you use. You would still have to put a sensor after the in, into the uh, downstream, measure the presence of the of the toxic species, send the signal to the computer. Computer analyzes it, then sends the signal to the actuator, which opens or closes the well. Now imagine if you can produce the uh, membrane itself, which has the sensor part and has the actuator part. So then whenever you have some, uh, some toxic species are, are, are present, so those, change, those, uh, those uh, actuating parts can change the, the information close the, 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 the pores. And in this case, you would have the membrane itself acting as a sensor as a computer as an as an actuator and that's and that's what we what we what we call intelligent and functional functional materials now um so in principle so the idea is clear the problem is that it's not that simple to 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 uh, realize it because well, you essentially, if you want this material to do something for you, it needs to be in the in the metal stable state. And we and and generically, we uh, try to think about about our materials as something fixed, something in the in the ground state. So basically, we we have some ideas how to how to design those 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 new materials. Well, first, uh, we think it, it should be 
composites and it should be, uh, that there should be strong interaction between individual components, but also this interaction should come through a multiple different channels, like Coulomb, like, uh, like Van der Waals, like, like strain, and, and, and then you, can, you, you would be able to create a so-called um, degenerate uh, energy landscape, basically a very glossy, uh, glossy system with multiple metastable states next to each other, and then, and then you should be able to navigate inside of this, inside of this landscape, and uh, just once you return back into the original state, you would already done some, some useful work. So this idea is not, is not new at all, so most proteins actually work exactly in the same manner. So mo the reason our proteins, proteins in our body are so versatile is because uh, exactly they, they can exist in multiple, uh, multiple metastable states and, uh, and um, so they, they can exist in different conformations and then depending on the, on the particular conformation they can uh, w uh, do certain function, they catalyze this or another or another reaction, and basically once they do this, they, they fall back into the into the uh, into the ground state, and that's so that's that's what we would like to do with 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 our, with our materials to create them in the metastable state, make them to 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 do some useful work, and then uh, and uh, and then return back into the into the ground state. The issue is that a modern uh, approach, physical approach, physical formalism doesn't really help us here because uh, everything we do, we would, uh, we would predict uh, mostly the ground state, the most, the most stable, the lowest energy state. If you want to do something with the metastable states, we simply don't have a um, uh, mathematical apparatus for this. And uh, we, we try to use machine learning um, uh, approaches to, to, to tackle this issue. And of course, you would need some, uh, some materials, robotics as well, to, to create enough data. So when you think about, uh, about materials robotics, you would, you would think about something like this, that you, you basically, well, this is from our collaborators who filmed our students and then, and then, um, and then created robots which, which, which just replicate what, what, what students do. And I can tell you, it's, uh, it's really a pain to work, to work with, this, with those robots. So it's much, much, it's, it's much, much better to, to, to ask the students to, to do it. So we, we really don't, don't, we pretty much don't use those, um, those universal robots. We, we basically try to work with the dedicated robotic system, so those which are, which are just programmed to do one particular task or one particular material, so we have, we have a number of them. And um, so, again, this is now a, a long introduction, and the major part of my talk, so I would really like to focus on a few, uh, a few approaches, a few directions. How can we create, uh, so how can we use AI for, for, for the materials design, and especially how can we use AI for the design of the dynamic material. So let me give you uh, one example of such, of, of such work. So it's, it's been done in, in our institute, so the major people are at Keda, uh, Li Chin Chao and Beatrice, and so here we have the uh, simple task, or re re relatively simple task of prediction of the uh, folding and unfolding of, of a polymer chain. So it's, um, it's dynamic material, it has a number of metastable states, and it's extremely difficult to predict. So if you try to, if you try to predict it, you would have to do the full-scale uh, full calculation, and the, and the question is, can we create a um, uh, uh, machine learning system which would, which would be able to predict the behavior of such, of such polymers. So it's much, uh, I should say, it's much, much simpler problem than, than proteins because polymers are usually non-charged so you don't have long range uh, um, uh, uh, many body interaction so it's like million times simpler than, than a protein but still, but, but still, quite, uh, still, still quite challenging. So basically, the simple question is: uh, Imagine you have the, a polymer, and then you try to try to stretch it. And uh, so, how fast can you do it? And can you predict 
some of the, can you predict its behavior? And the answer is, it's, uh, it's ex as I said, it's extremely difficult. So, uh, so here are the example of the three polymers. It's the same chemical composition, just different, uh, different initial folding. And the question is, if you, if you try to stretch it, how fast can you do it? So you would actually, if you try to do it, you would see that this green one, pretty much always you would, uh, would uh, stretch very fast. The blue one, it would take much, much longer time. And for the purple, sometimes it would stretch fast and sometimes it would, it, it would take really long time to, to do it. So how can, we, how can we predict it? And so here we, we really um, try to create the AI approach to, uh, to learn some new physics and to create some uh, new physics, or we call it the, we, we try to create custom thermodynamics. Let me try to explain you what, what I mean. So we all know what thermodynamics is. So if you want to describe the um, uh, atoms or molecules in this room, what you do, the full description is to state uh, all the coordinates, all the, all the velocities of all the gas molecules, right? So that's the full description of, of the system. Of course, it's extremely unpractical. We have billions of those, of those molecules. You, you, you cannot write, you, you, you cannot do this, those billions of, of, of equations. Instead, what we do, we, we use the, the thermodynamic approach where we have two very simple parameters. We have temperature and we have pressure, and then they're linked through the equation of state for the ideal gas, and then we can describe some average properties of the ideal gas, which is in most cases uh, enough. And the question is how, uh, well, it's actually, I mean, it, it looks very simple, but I should remind you, it took humanity 200 years to realize that, uh, that this, this equation, and, and, uh, and especially to realize what is this KT is. So temperature, it's not that immediately obvious that you need to take the projection of velocity, uh, average it, square, sorry, square it, average it, and then, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, just uh, multiply by, by three half KB, and that's, that's your kinetic energy. It's not, it's not, uh, sorry, and that's your temperature. It's not, it's not obvious at all. So how can, can, uh, uh, can uh, AI help us to create the, the custom thermodynamics and learn those, those parameters which, uh, which describe the system? So imagine we have this polymer chain. Can AI uh, learn the, the new, the reduced coordinates, those, uh, I don't know, effective temperature, or effective something, and, uh, and write the, 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 the uh, equation of motion. And then if we can create such, a, such an AI, AI approach, we, you can, should be able to apply it to pretty much any area of, of science. You just show the behavior of a system and then it spits out the equations. Like, I don't know, a Kepler, um, uh, uh, Kepler laws or maybe Newton laws, so, so it, it will start creating uh, science by, by itself. So basically, um, of course, you, you need to play some, some tricks. Not any AI would do it, so we, we have to put some ideas into the mind of, of, of AI, and the, in this case, we, we chose to, to, to have the uh, Ansaga principle, so we just we plug in, we tell the most, I think it's the most generic principle of, of, of science, the Ansaga, Ansaga principle. And then uh, we ask it, okay, select few coordinates, countable number, so rather than knowing each, each uh, the positions of all the atoms, just give us three, four coordinates, and then, uh, and then write down the, the, the equation of state. So in terms of, in, in terms of the um, uh, ideal gas, we would tell it, okay, so you have, just look at, at all the, uh, at the behavior of this, of this gas, and then give us, uh, find something which looks like uh, some generic coordinates, so it should find pressure and temperature. And, and, and then write the, 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 uh, the uh, equation of state. Now, can we do this for the, uh, 
uh, more complex system like like uh, a polymer chain, and apparently, and in principle, it does. So it can. So we are. So it spits out. So we, when we run this uh, AI, it gives out, us out three uh, three generic uh, generic coordinates. Uh, in principle, it doesn't. They don't need to have any physical meaning. So they can be. It, uh, it they can be anything. Luckily, we were quite lucky that they do. And to figure out what do they mean, we use another uh, interesting um, property of, of, of AI that it is fully, uh, it, it can be, uh, uh, you can take a derivative of this, of the, of, of, of the AI of your, of, your, of your matrices. And then you can um, figure out the physical meaning of those of those coordinates. So one is actually, so one is the length. So then and then the other are the foldiness and the and the separation between the between the ends. And now we can basically simply look into the uh, at the initial state, and then AI can predict statistically the behavior of this or 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 another polymer chain. So you don't need to do all the all the all the calculation. You simply take those three coordinates and then it can it can give you the it can spit out the uh, the the behavior you can actually even write down the uh, the equation of state so in this case you, you basically plot this matrix uh, the the matrices which is the effective potential and immediately you can see why some of the polymer chain can be stretched easily, some of, some of them cannot, because there are a number of saddle points which are basically, which basically almost uh, metastable states, and then if your system gets inside of this, inside of this metastable point, so this is the potential plotted in the, this specific effective coordinates. So, and then this blue trajectory, so it's just stuck in this, in this, uh, Settle point, and then and then it it, it takes it takes much much longer for, for it to, to 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 get down in this potential. So, of course, it it doesn't have much meaning by itself. So it just it's effective potential, effective coordinates. But at the end of the day, it describes the physical uh, system quite well. More, uh, it's really impressive that that um, so you can model it. And, and AI is trained on the simulated data, but then it actually fits really, fits really nicely the behavior of a real system. So we observe the behavior of this polymer chain under a microscope, and this trained uh, AI trained on, trained on the uh, simulated data fits nicely the, uh, the experimental data as well. So this is the, the, the example of the, of the kind of work which, which, we, uh, which we do now, and we try to apply AI for the design of materials, but not just any material, for the dynamic materials, those which can have some dynamic properties and can have memory, like metastable states, and so on. Uh, polymers are reasonably simple uh, example. It's easy to, to, to do the calculations, it's easy to train, but then ideally we would really like to to apply it to something much more much more complex. So something we we don't have a solution uh, for yet. So here is an example of um, such a dynamic another dynamic system like this is the uh, is the uh, high entropy uh, high entropy alloy, uh, and basically it was designed to have the to have this self uh, self self uh, self healing. Property. So high entropy alloy, you basically take you know, six, ten uh, different elements, mix them two together, and then and then uh, create a very very mixed state at, by quenching it from the uh, from the melting point at uh, at at high temperature. If you're lucky, it will be uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the in the crystalline state, though it, it shouldn't be. So, but in this case, it is. And and basically, if you done everything right, then uh, you can program some very specific, very interesting properties into those into those um, those alloys. So in this case, it was programmed to have the the uh, self healing property. So it, it's a TMP picture. The tiny dots are the atoms, and then we drill a hole inside inside, and then and then uh, if it's given enough time and it's given enough uh, some some energy, it will close this hole 
by itself so it just it just uh, uh, it just grows uh, uh, just grows grows back high entropy alloys are pretty much impossible to model by by any uh, any technology by by DFT or Monte Carlo it's really it's really a pain and we really hope that with this AI approach which we are trying to develop would be able to help us with with those with those um, with this work so then uh, so then another another example are the are the drug delivery so we can create those uh, scrolls from the two-dimensional materials which can be programmed to scroll and unscroll uh, in 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in specific conditions so it does uh, so in principle it can be uh, it can be done and uh, one of the big application are the are the drag drag delivery because you can scroll it just program it to, to be scrolled in the uh, in the low pH and the high acidity conditions and then open up only when it goes into the uh, when it goes into the uh, into the intestine with the with the low pH so it does work it, it does work reasonably well so we have it so girls who are here, here so they they uh, they can they can program it quite uh, quite well uh, I cannot show you the, the video of, of that because um, because it's, uh, those are tiny those are what a uh, few nanometers across but uh, so Chiang can 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 program macroscopic uh, materials to, to do the same so you can you can program it to 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 to, uh, to change their shape change their conformation depending on many parameters lights temperature humidity humidity pH and uh, and of course you can use it for many many different applications so here is an example of our work on the on this on the smart uh, anti corrosion coating you basically create uh, a ca capsules of uh, which which contain a buffer solution and then they, they can open or close depending on the on the um, on the environment and then if you uh, you, you, if, if you program it in, in such a way that they release the buffer solution when there is um, uh, when they sense the presence of the uh, of, of the corrosion reaction, they can extinguish the reaction early on, and then and then you can you can create so you, you can uh, so you can create the the, the new way of uh, of um, of uh, of fighting uh, fighting corrosion. So um, I probably have only. Two three minutes left. Just want, uh, just very very quickly, very briefly, want to go through this, um, through the, uh, uh, through a couple of other applications of, of of AI. So the dynamic machine learning is is one area which we which we try to uh, to develop. But in principle, you can uh, start to modify your materials not only on the layer but by layer. Uh, uh, level, but also on the on the atomic on atomic level as well. And there are a number of applications which would really benefit from this. So one is the single photonometers for um, uh, for the uh, for quantum telecommunication uh, applications. So they so this this work started some time ago with quantum dots in tungsten selenide. So these days probably most popular is the uh, carbon doped borom uh, borom nitride, where you have a number of those of those sharp peaks. Some of them are indeed are indeed a uh, single photon, and uh, the, the big problem is uh, to actually know what kind of defects, what kind of quantum dots do you need to create in order to in order to uh, to uh, to uh, create efficient um, single photon emitters. So we can measure the properties of those of those defects we can do stm but still which which particular defect is that is is working there is extremely difficult to uh, to predict so it's been already what four five years since this uh, single photonometers in in bn have been discovered and yet we're still only guessing which what what kind of defects are actually are actually working there so um, to this end, we created a database of uh, of uh, many different defects in two-dimensional materials. So it, so these days we have a database of about um, fifteen thousand uh, uh, of 
different defects and about a dozen of different of different materials. So it's a so it, it has a certain structure. It's all kind of triple defects plus sporadic high uh, high uh, high density defects. And we created the um, machine learning approach, the descriptors, specific descriptors, how to uh, how to describe those uh, those those defects. So one of the uh, I should say that. It's not again. It's not that that simple. It, it turned out to be that you need to teach this ML a little bit of the of the uh, quantum mechanics as well. So this the this quantum shells, quantum mechanical shells, and the uh, symmetry of, of the wave function is uh, extremely important if you want to to have a proper a description of the of the quantum properties of those of those defects. But nevertheless. Uh, so the database is now open for uh, just uh, for for public place. Uh, if you if, if you want to, to use it, it is it, it is published on this uh, on this uh, on this server. And as uh, as I said, it's not only the database itself; it's also the descriptions and the uh, and the machine learning uh, approach. So it is there and and uh, the the way our descriptors work is actually much much better much more appropriate uh, appropriate way to describe those those defects i should say that another big big application of the of those individual defects is the applications in single atom uh, single atom catalysis you add just a few selenium atoms to mos2 or just a few tungsten atoms into MOS2, and you increase the the catalytic ability of those of those materials dramatically. Unfortunately, we are not there yet to describe it by by machine learning, and the problem is actually exactly the metastable state. Is that when when you create those those defects, you actually freeze your system in the not in the ground state, but in the in the metastable state. So you change the phase of the material quite actively and then and, and that's what 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 uh, controls the 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 catalytic ability and that's something which we are working on on now but let's say so but it looks like this uh, these metastable states are, are extremely important and maybe just um, last thing what to 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 to, uh, to advertise we also work because our structures our our materials become uh, more and more uh, complex say I don't know if you if you want to work on twisted ballet graphene or uh, graphene on borom nitride it's at least 10 nanometer unit cell usually more 20 so it's huge number of atoms we cannot use the traditional DFT methods to uh, to calculate this so we uh, develop our own uh, DFT package now so which which works significantly faster so we call it D4FT because it is differentiable and so it's it scales as n cube rather than uh, rather than n and to the power of 4 as the as the traditional DFT and the, we don't use the AI per se but we use AI tricks from the from the uh, from the uh, TensorFlow, and it's uh, so the tricks are in the uh, articulation of the of the wave functions plus into the solving of, of some of the of some of the uh, of, of some of the integrals. But uh, eventually, it works much faster than the than the uh, traditional DFT, and really hope that that will be we should be able to use this this approach very soon for to calculate many different. Uh, properties of complex materials so I think I will stop here just to say that that it's uh, it's uh, it's really it's been uh, so I think we are starting a new era in the uh, in the uh, functional materials design and uh, so rather than simply creating new materials with the with the predetermined properties which which is the state of that right now we really hope that we, we, we should be able to create dynamic Materials, materials in the metastable states, those with the memory functions, and then the range of of, of, of applications will be uh, will, will will increase increase dramatically. So, thank you so much for your attention. It's really a great pleasure. And again, congratulations to the to the BGI and Liu Liu Zhongfan with the most impressive uh, impre with the most impressive developments over the last few years. Thank you.